risen ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. If you've looked at our weekly benefits newsletters recently, either at one of our services or via our online media, you may have noticed that for the last five weeks, some of us have been following the Living in Love and Faith course on Wednesday evenings. It might seem a strange choice of name. How else should we expect Christians to live but in love and faith? Didn't Jesus tell us to love our neighbour as ourself, to love one another as I have loved you. This exposes a weakness in the wonderful English language in which we are now fortunate to be able to read the Word of God. The New Testament was written in Greek, the universal language of its day. New Testament Greek has at least four words which translate into English as simply love. There is agape, the selfless, universal love modelled by Jesus himself. There's philia, the love between friends. There's storge, the unconditional love between members of a family. And there's eros, physical, sexual love. Replace love in the title, Living in Love and Faith, with each of these in turn, and the context changes significantly. And yes, I think it is intended to embrace all of them. To quote from the course material, the course aims to help Christians think more deeply about what it means to be human. It provides a structured and accessible way for local groups to engage in and reflect on living in love and faith, a major new exploration of Christian teaching and learning about identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage. If you've been listening to the media reports of what our bishops have been saying around the country, you'll know that this is a hot topic at the moment. But why, you may ask, apart from the fact that we finished the course last week, am I telling you this today? Well, the timetable of the course wasn't planned with any particular end date in mind. We took the week immediately following Easter off and then started the course the following Wednesday, the 19th of April. And hence we finished last week. Now, each session of the course included the Bible study to try to understand what scripture has to say about the topics of the course. The identity, the sexuality, relationships and marriage, those, those hard issues. And the passage we studied last Wednesday was John 17, the same chapter from which today's gospel is taken. Now, I don't believe that that sort of thing is coincidence. I don't think God does coincidence. I believe that when you repeatedly come across the same Bible passage like that, it's God's way of telling you that you really need to take notice of what the passage has to say. The portion of the chapter set for today's reading ends with Jesus saying, And now I am no longer in the world but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. So that they may be one, as we are one. Jesus' prayer, as he is about to leave his followers, is that they should be one, as he and his Father are one. That we, all of us, should be community, just as the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit model a community, defined as much by relationship as identity. And I realised that this also felt like a coincidence, which wasn't. 
We based our Good Friday reflections this year on Stephen Cottrell's new book, God Forsaken. In this, he reflects on Jesus' last desolate cry from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He sees this apparent fracturing of the relationship between Father and Son, of the relationship within the Trinity, as a necessary step to allow humanity back into communion with God, back into the community of the Trinity. And if we are to be in communion with the Holy Trinity, surely we must live in community with each other. In my sermon on Easter Sunday, I read a further extract from that book. Two sentences stood out. Our life is joined to God's life by the cross. All are brought into reconciliation and community with God in one body through the cross. And the abundantly clear message of Easter is that that reconciliation, that community with God, applies to everyone, all humankind. And within that, there is no place for any of the things which can divide us. Cultural lists them. Race hatred, prejudice, homophobia, misogyny, transphobia, xenophobia. Clear pointer towards living in love and faith. And again, on the eve of the coronation, the nation was asked to pray Living God, you bring us together in community. Teach us to love one another as you have loved us. As God is community, three persons in one God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we who are made in God's image are made to live in community, whether within our families, with our friends, our workmates, our classmates, and yes, our churches. It is living in community which shapes our characters and behaviours. It is living, in, living as a community of God that we find our true identity as we grow in faith together. Being a community of God is also about being a community of love, of belonging and of togetherness. We learn to see the nature of God in the faces of others. Our community will in turn come to reflect the character of God in the world. Community, community, community. It's as if God were taking every opportunity to bring living in community to the forefront of our minds, to make that message inescapable. The reflection which accompanied John 17 in the Living in Love and Faith guide begins like this. I'll, I'll read two paragraphs from it. During the COVID-19 lockdown, we learned afresh that church is not primarily a building. It's a community of people who belong to Jesus Christ. It's a community of people called to express God's lavish love to the world, the love embodied in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. It's a community which calls us into a way of life that reflects God's distinctive character, God's holiness. This holy life is a life of genuine mutual love in which all the members of the community, to quote Peter, love one another deeply from the heart, in obedience and joy. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. <laughs> it's not a community of perfect people, but of people who are being transformed into the likeness of Christ in every aspect of their lives. And because no one lives up to this calling, it's a community where we can admit our sinfulness, repent, and receive forgiveness. 
And so the church is called to be a community where everyone is welcome, where no one is made to feel excluded simply because of who they are. It's a community called to follow Jesus' example by welcoming the poor, the marginalised, the excluded and the despised. Now there is so much more to be said about this, but I suspect I've already stretched your patience. We'll have to wait for another time. For now, I invite you to join me in praying again the words of today's alternate college, which I began with. Risen ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen.